I'm going to tell or to say a phrase. I'm going to air this out here, and I want you to just kind of sit with it for a moment. See what you think. See what it strikes within you. Does it cause a reaction? Does it not? Something like that. And here's what it is. If you work hard, life will go well for you. I'm going to say it again. If you work hard, life will go well for you. How does that sit within your spirit? How does that sit within your heart? You know, it doesn't. Well, I don't know. It's... All right, there's something there. There's a story there. What's interesting about the phrase, many things, is this not our American heritage? We are, we are the self-made people. People come here from all over the world for the land of opportunity, in order for the land to make something of their lives. This is what we teach in our schools. Hey, work hard in school. Why do I need to work hard? So you can get into a good college. Why do I need to go to college? So you can get a good job. Why do I need a good job? So that you can enjoy life. So that you can have a good bank account. So that you can enjoy everything that this life has for you. Because if you work hard, life will go well for you. And we apply this often without thinking it. But I think we usually live by a motto that goes something similar to it. Think about it like this. If you raise children, while your children were in your home, you were thinking to yourself, I'm going to work hard at being a parent, at a mom, at a dad. I'm going to be the coolest dad on the block so that my kids, when they grow up, they'll love me and they'll bring their kids over and we'll have nothing but a good time at the house. And so you work hard to be a parent. That's a good thing. Because if you work hard, life will go well for you. You apply this at work. I'm going to show up early. I'm going to stay in late. I'm going to get the project done ahead of time. I'm going to do everything I can so that when that promotion comes, I'm going to be first in line. If you work hard, life will go well for you. We do this with our friendships. I'm going to be the best friend I can. I'm going to be the one that listens. I'm going to be the one that has empathy. I'm going to be the one that's there. Anytime my friend needs help, they can call and I'll be there. Because if we work hard, life will go well for us. However, as what happens with all of our models, all of our sayings, all of our thoughts, sooner or later, they get run right into with reality. I remember I was walking around. I was attending a class at this other church, larger church, and I had to step out for a phone call. So I was in another room and on the dry erase board. They had written something like this, and I thought it was absolutely amazing. And it says, see if I can remember correctly, reality smacks slogans in the face. <laughs> Have you experienced that? If you've been around on this earth for any longer than five minutes, you've realized even when we work hard, life doesn't always go well for us. Even though you worked hard at being a parent and you did everything you could for your kids and you tried to provide them the life you never had, sometimes when they grow up and when they move out, they're still not going to return the phone calls. Because sometimes even when we work hard, life doesn't go well. Sometimes at work, you show up early, you stay late, you do everything you can, you get the project done before the deadline, and then when the promotion comes, it's given to him anyways. Because sometimes, even when we work hard, life doesn't go well for us. With your friendships, you work hard at being a friend. You're going to be the one that's there. You're going to listen. You're going to be the one that's empathetic. You're going to be the one that supports them. But even in the midst of all of that, sometimes you realize your friends, not only do they not return your calls, but they don't really make any. That the only time you speak with them is when you're initiating. Even when we work hard, life doesn't always go well for us. And this tension here, this creates a tension between what we think to be true, what we tell ourselves is true, what we teach in our schools, what we live by, and by what reality actually gives us. Because they're so opposite at times, they create a tension within us when we're left wondering, I did all the right things. I did everything I was supposed to. I saved, I invested for 30 years, I retired in January of 2020, 
only six weeks later to see my bank account, my retirement go down by about a third. And so then I had to try to go back to work, but everybody's losing employment at that time. But I'm able to find something and work the way up. And I saw my 401k get bigger and bigger. So then I figured, okay, I'm good. And so January 1st of last year, I retired again. And what happened? About 20% later is where we find ourselves today, give or take, maybe more, maybe less. Even when we work hard, life doesn't always go well for us. The beautiful thing about God, the beautiful thing about the Bible, is that God is not pretending as if this tension doesn't exist. The Bible doesn't pretend this tension doesn't exist. Too often we take the stories of the Bible and we flatten them. And we get rid of the tension, we get rid of the conflict, and we make every story and everything within the Bible some simple moral lesson about doing good and being nice and all these wonderful things. And when we do that, we do such a disservice to God's Word because we miss the wonders within His Word. The Bible embraces this tension. The Bible fully lives out this tension, and it speaks to us in the midst of it. In fact, today we're going to see, we're going to look at the life of one person in the Bible, a giant in the Bible. In fact, outside of Jesus, no one is mentioned more in the scriptures than this one person. The person I'm talking about is King David. He is mentioned over a thousand times in the Old and the New Testaments. It is literally impossible to read the Bible, to read the story of Scripture, and walk away never having heard of David. You can't do it. You know, there's other people in the Bible, and you might read through it, and then, you know, if someone asks you, hey, do you remember the story of, and you're scratching your head going, no, not really, but, you know, they might remind you of it, and then it dawns on you. You can't do that with David. David is a giant in the Old Testament. He's a giant in the New Testament. And what we see from the life of David is not only how to embrace this tension that we feel, how to sit in it, but also how God moves toward us in the midst of this tension. You see, the life of David, it fits our series that we're in right now perfectly. This series looking at God's story from garden to city, and how we've seen ever since the creation, God's heart is to fill the world with worship, that everyone might know him. How through the creation itself, God's desire is to bless the world. And then even through the fall, when Adam and Eve sinned, when they turned away from the Lord, the Lord did not give up his desire to bless. In fact, he promised that one would come that would reverse the curse. Now we get rid of this curse that we feel, that we live under, this pain that we experience. And through that, God would bless the world. We looked at the life of Abraham, where God made a promise to Abraham, through you, through your family, I'm going to bless the world. We looked at the Exodus and how each one of the plagues of the wonders that we see as God brought his people out of slavery, how each one of them was designed that the world, that the nations might know that God is a God of blessing. And we saw the miracle that when God's people left Egypt, a whole bunch of Egyptians went with them. They got it. They saw what God was about. They saw what Yahweh was about. And they said, I want to follow him. Last week, we looked at the law. We looked at how through the law, God is setting his people up. He is governing them to bless. About how when we look at the law today on its own, we might think this thing just doesn't really make any sense. And it seems oppressive. It seems all of these things. But when we look at the law and set in the context of the time, especially against the other cultures of the day, we see that God's law it sucks the air out of the room for any who would be oppressive. But how God's law is one of redemption, is one of blessing. And the intent behind it was that all the world might be blessed, that they would see God's people following this wise law, and they would say, how great is their God that he lives so near to them. I want to be a part of that. Today, we're fast-forwarding a little bit. Remember, we're hitting the highlights of Scripture, the big milestones, looking at the story of Scripture from 10,000 feet, and we're coming to this giant, old King David. And through David, 
God wants to bless the entire world, that the world might know that he is the Lord and might experience life in him and through him. Now, we're going to begin today, we're going to read a passage that on its face seems to have nothing to do with David. He's not even mentioned, but it sets the stage, it sets the tone for everything that is to come. Little Bible trivia for you, and this way you can answer the question on Jeopardy next time it's on. We're going to look at 1 Samuel. Now, have you ever read 1 and 2 Samuel? I remember the first time I read it, you get to the end of 1 Samuel, and Samuel, he's a prophet, he dies. Have you ever read that at the end of 1 Samuel and then wondered what the world is 2 Samuel about? How can there be a 2 Samuel when Samuel's dead? What's going on here? 1 and 2 Samuel, when they were written, it was one book. At the time, you know, folks, they didn't type in the typewriters. They didn't have situations like this. They wrote on a big old scroll. And if you get that thing too long, you're carrying it around like this, and it's just a little bit cumbersome. And then you got to try to find your place within it to read at the temple. And so what they decided was they said, here's the middle of it. And they took a pair of scissors and went, and so now there's two scrolls, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. But remember, it's one book, one writing, one story, just cut in half for the ease of use. We're going to look at a song that was sung by a barren woman after the Lord gave her a son. In the Bible, when barren women start to have kids, watch out, because something big is about to happen. Open your Bibles up. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. We'll start reading in verse 1. This is about Hannah, is the lady's name. This is after she prayed to the Lord for a child, the Lord blessed her, and she is singing a song of praise. It says, Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. A horn is a symbol of strength, of might, something like that. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with the princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven, and the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed the cry really of our heritage, if you work hard, life will go well for you. In God's kingdom, we see what's what's oftentimes called an upside down kingdom, where God takes the strong, God takes the strength of the strong, the strength of the mighty, the strength of the powerful, and he lays it to the side. And instead, he takes those who appear weak, those who appear powerless, those who appear to have nothing, and he seats them with the princes. He gives them everything. God invites us into an upside down kingdom. Just look at everything that we see within here. The bows of the warriors, the strong ones are broken, but those who stumble, those who have fallen, they 
are armed with strength. Those who are full are hiring themselves out for food. The full are hungry, but those who are hungry are made full. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has many sons pines away. God's kingdom is an upside down kingdom. It's a reverse the curse kingdom. It's not a kingdom that people gain entry into by force. It's not a kingdom that when we walk in, we bring our strength and our might and our power within us. We don't walk into God's kingdom and say, I'm a self-made man. I did it. I'm here. I've earned it. No one walks into God's kingdom and says, I'm getting exactly what I deserve because God's kingdom is an upside down kingdom. This is the tension. This is the answer to the tension that we have in life. When our expectations and reality clash together, we remind ourselves in God's kingdom. Here, I might not have much strength, but God gives me strength. Here, I may be of no reputation, but God gives me reputation. Here, I might not be much. On my own, I might not be much. But Christ in me is amazing. Look at a couple things in this prayer. At the tail end of verse 9, it is not by strength that one prevails. It is not by strength that one prevails. That could be a theme verse for really the entire scripture, the story of Bible. It is not by strength. Elsewhere, the prophet reminds us it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit. It's not by our own strength that we prevail. Rather, the strength of the Lord. And then within here, right afterwards, it says, he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn, the might, the strength of his anointed. Now you might be thinking when you read this, but Israel doesn't have a king. Well, that's true. Not yet. Israel's going to ask for a king. Now here's the problem with kings in that time and in that place they weren't very different from kings we have today. What do the kings look for today? More power, more money, more prestige, more land, more everything. The kings back then, they did the exact same thing. And they're willing to use anyone to get to where they needed to be. Now, sometimes we might look at that, we might think, well, God thinks kings are bad, but that's not what we see. It's, the issue wasn't, and here's just a little bit of nuance, the issue wasn't that Israel wanted a king per se. Here, Hannah is singing, God's going to give strength to the king. Way back in the law, when there was no king, Deuteronomy 17, it speaks about the king. This is how the king shall live. It speaks directly towards the king. If God didn't want a king in the first place, he would have said, no king. Instead, he makes provision for the king. The issue was that Israel, God's people, they wanted a king like the nations. They looked around them and saw all these kings full of strength, full of might, with their big armies that could conquer the enemies around them, that could take plunder from nations around them. And Israel said, I want to be like that. I want a king like that, that can conquer the tribes around us, take all their gold, take all their stuff, and give it to us. The issue wasn't that Israel wanted a king. The issue was that Israel wanted a king just like the nations. But it's not by strength that one prevails. They forgot that part right there. Now, before Samuel, we have a book called Judges. And the theme verse in Judges, you see it at the beginning, you see it at the end. And it says, in those days, there were no kings in Israel. Everyone did what was right in the Lord's eyes. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And as you read through Judges, I've got a series in Judges in my back pocket. It's going to be a great time. As you read through Judges, as everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes, the situation, the morality, the culture, the pick something, that in Israel went down, 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 down. And then you get to the end of Judges and you read that and you start to wonder, what? is going on here? How could God's people have fallen so far? And the writer of Judges tells us there was no king in those days. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so out of that, 
people are fearful, fearful of their neighbor, fearful of the other tribes, and they're thinking, we need a strong king that's going to enforce the law, enforce his will by might. We need that not only to conquer our enemies outside of Israel, but to conquer our enemies inside of Israel. It's as if they are saying, we can't prevail unless we have strength. But God says, it's not by strength that one prevails. Now, in verse 3 here, as Hannah is singing, which, by the way, it was a gift of me to read it and not sing it for you. You're welcome. Just wanted to put that out there. When she says, do not keep talking so proudly, that's how the NIV translates the verse uh, that you see there. <clears throat> the, the words that are used for proudly are also translated as high, proud, and tall. It's as if Hannah is saying, the Lord is saying through Hannah, don't keep speaking about tall. I don't like tall. Don't talk about tall anymore. Now, if you're here and if you're over six foot, God doesn't have an issue with you. That's not what he's talking about. Tall, it becomes a symbol. Because when we look to our own strength, when we want to appear strong, what do we do? Mm. We make ourselves tall. We make ourselves big. And we say, look at the strength that I have. Through my strength, I will accomplish this. But God is saying, it's not by strength that one prevails. And just to make sure of it, don't talk about tall anymore. Get that thought out of your mind. Fast forward a few chapters, Israel looks for a king and they take a man named Saul and they make him king. And what does it say about Saul? He's a head taller than everybody else. The author is telling us, watch out. Something's not going to go well for Saul. Instead of saying, don't look at Tong anymore, they found the tallest dude around and said, you are our king. And then if we fast forward again a whole bunch, oh, Saul, he dies in battle. And then what does the enemy army do with Saul? And they brought Saul back down to size. They removed his pride from him. Now that sounds barbaric, and it is. Someday in the future, we might do a series about violence and war in the Bible, but not today. So we're just kind of moving through it. But the author is showing us Saul's pride was as tall, and the Lord brought him down. If you look at David, when David is fleeing Jerusalem, his son Absalom is chasing after him, trying to kill him so that he can take the throne. And then old Absalom dies in battle. This man who trusted in his own strength, and how does he die? His hair gets caught up. And as his horse is riding through, it's as if he gets caught into a tree and the horse keeps going, and then he's killed. His head, his height, became his downfall. The Lord is saying in a literary way in this book, don't look at tall. It's not by strength that one prevails. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves. Rewind a little bit. Saul becomes king. Tall Saul, the tallest man around, the mightiest man around. He's the one that by might and by strength we will prevail. But what happens every time you trust in your strength? you meet someone stronger. Tall Saul met someone taller, and his name was Goliath. Goliath was the tallest dude around. And Saul, who trusted in his own mind, who you said, by my strength, we will be able to prevail. He takes one look at Goliath, and I imagine he did one of these things. And he said, not today, not today, Goliath. And he starts walking back. Well, what's going to happen with Israel? Samuel, who's the prophet who anointed Saul to become king, the Lord tells Samuel he's rejected Saul. Saul was a prideful man. He trusts in his strength. And the Lord says, that's not what we do in my kingdom. It's not by strength that one prevails. And so the Lord sends Samuel to David's family, to Jesse's family, and says, we're going to anoint one of Jesse's sons as king. And so Jesse, he gets most of his sons. He leaves one out because no one would want that little one anyways. He brings most of his sons in front of Samuel and old Eliab, this strong, this proud, this man who was a man's man, who was the picture of might. He stands up and Samuel, he gets caught up in the moment. And he says, Lord, surely this is the one. Not only can this man be bigger and taller than Saul, he might be able to take down Goliath. But then the Lord says, the Lord said to Samuel, Speaking about Eliab, 
do not consider his appearance or his height. We're done with tall, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Samuel, this prophet of God, is getting caught up in a moment. We need a big, tall guy. And the Lord says, we're done with tall. We tried tall. We got tall, Saul. And that didn't work out one little bit. And so instead, Samuel goes to the little town of Bethlehem. That'd be another great song. And comes by this little family. And in that little family, he takes the littlest son they have, old David, and makes him king. Saul was tall. He trusted in his strength, and he's killed in battle. Absalom was tall. He trusted in his strength with the long, wavy locks of hair, which sometimes I get jealous of. That's a story for a different day. And he's killed in battle. David trusts in the Lord, and he dies of old age. The author is telling us something. It's not by strength that we prevail. If we put our trust in our strength, we're saying, if I work hard, if I'm strong enough, if I'm big enough, if I'm rich enough, if I love my spouse enough, things will go well for me. And God is saying, that's not how life works. And so David, the littlest son, the shepherd, the sheep herder, he comes to the camp where the Israelites are facing the Philistines and there's Goliath out there shouting his curses and his blasphemy against God and against Saul and against God's people. And David says, somebody should do something about that. And the army sees David talking and they say, boy, get out of here. Get back to the sheep fields. You ain't going to do nothing. And so David, and I'd be, I would love to have been a fly on the wall for this bit, when he goes up to Saul, King Saul, and he says, I'll go get David. And something within there made Saul go, okay, that sounds like a great plan to me. We'll let the little shepherd boy go get the giant. Either Saul had, you know, I've heard some folks say, well, Saul knew the Lord and the Lord had told him to let David go. He's like, okay, okay, okay. Part of it could have also been Saul was thinking, I will send anyone who volunteers because I don't want to deal with it. I want to keep my head where it's attached. And the first person that volunteered was little old David. And so what does Saul do? Saul looks at little David and he says, hey, you need to be big and tall like me. You need to be strong like me. And so he takes his armor and he puts it on David. But it just doesn't fit right. And so David says, I don't need any of that stuff. He goes down to the river. He gets a few stones. He's got a slingshot. It's a weapon in the day. And he goes to face the giant. And the story is, Goliath, as he sees David approaching, what does he say? Am I a dog <laughs> that you would send me with sticks? What is, what is this? David, Goliath looks at David and says, this puny little rodent, what are we doing here? And then he continues to curse the God of Israel. And David responds, it's not by strength that I'm going to prevail. It's not by might, it's not by power. It's by the Lord's spirit. And God gives David victory that day over Goliath. Now, you notice David went and got stones, used them, whacked the giant in the head. And that's where the children's books end, by the way. I was really rather shocked to, end, uh, to read the story keeps going the first time I read it in the Bible. Old tall Goliath, what happens to him? He gets a little bit shorter. <laughs> the Lord removes his pride. It's not by strength that we prevail. Why did David use stones? Have you ever wondered that? It could have been a practical thing. He's bigger than I am, so if I fight him from a distance, that'll be okay. If I get up close, you know, I'll get a haymaker, and that's the end of the ordeal. But I think the author's telling us something. David followed the law. David followed Yahweh, put his trust completely in Yahweh. And so he followed the law when the king wouldn't do it. The law says in Leviticus 24, 14, I believe, it could be a life verse for some, but it says anyone who blasphemes God shall be stoned to death. Old Goliath is standing out there blaspheming the Lord, and David's looking around saying, y'all know the law, what are we doing? And Saul, the one who's supposed to enforce the law, he's sitting back hiding in his tent. And so David goes and enforces the law of God. He listened to Yahweh. He knew who he was, 
And so he went, not in his strength. It's not by strength that one prevails, but in the strength of God. Now, after this, David has already been anointed king, but there's already a king, and his name's Saul. And if you become king and there's already a king living, let's just say dinner gets a little bit awkward, uh, to say the least. And Saul gets the idea, I'm going to kill that guy. Otherwise, he's going to become king and not me, and he's going to become king instead of my son. And so David's fleeing in the wilderness, and Saul's chasing them, and they go back and forth. There's a whole story there. Sooner or later, Saul dies. He dies in battle. And so David becomes king. In the meantime, while Saul is in the capital and is chasing David around, David's going around and defeating Israel's enemies. He's going around and doing what kings should do, protect their people. And in the midst of that, David becomes king. And the story of David is one big arch. He, everything gets better and better and better and better and better until when the time came for kings to go out to war and David stays home. And there's the sin with Bathsheba. And I believe 2 Samuel 11, I want to say. And from there, David begins his descent and his downfall. From there, he begins to look to himself for his strength. And then at the end of the book, the beginning of the book, Hannah prays, it's not by strength that one prevails. Hannah prays, don't speak so proudly. Don't look to yourself. Don't talk about tall anymore. At the end of the book, David does a census. Why would an ancient king do a census? To see how many men he could put in his army. David is trusting in his army to go and fight the nations around him. He's putting his strength in himself as king. He's putting his strength in his army. He's taking the promise that God gave to Abraham many years before when God told Abraham, look at the stars. If you can count them, so shall your people be. When God took Abraham and he says, count the sand, the sand on the ground, your people will be greater than that. They shall not be able to even be counted. And David says, watch me. I'll count them. He's looking to himself for strength. He has become a king just like the nations. You ever wondered why the census was such a big deal? That's why. Now, David had heard God's call to reverse the curse, to be a blessing to the nations. And David lived it for years. And then David rejected it. Now, even in the midst of living against it, his heart was still set on God. He's repenting. He's pursuing God. He's doing everything that he can. That's why the Lord says elsewhere that David was a man after God's own heart. Sometimes our actions don't match our heart. That's what David is experiencing. But that's why the census was such a big deal. Now, in the middle of the book of Samuel, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we have what many consider to be the most important chapter in the, Old, in the Old Testament. In 2 Samuel 7, Samuel is praying. It says that the Lord has given him rest from all his enemies, from everything going on. He's king. Everything's calmed down. And David prays and says, Lord, I want to build you a house. The Lord has dwelt about in the ark. He's living in a tent, so to speak. And David says, I'm going to build you a temple. I'm going to build you a house. And don't worry, Lord, it's going to be a great house. You're going to love it. But then the Lord answers David through the prophet Nathan. And he says, you want to build me a house? Thanks. I appreciate the offer. And the Lord says, I'm going to build you a house. You want to do this great thing for me? Guess what? I have something even greater for you. That chapter deserves a whole series of its own that we can't get into today. But suffice it for today to be God promised David out of a beautiful picture of grace. God takes the little that David has and he says, I'm going to give you so much more. The great things that we want to do, O oh church, for God, with God, the great things we want to do to establish our house, that our kids might know God, that our neighborhoods might know God. When we turn to the Lord, the Lord sees all of those. And he says, it's good that your heart is set on that. Guess what? I have something way better just for you. I'm going to build your house. 
And then as the Lord is responding to David, he, ma- he makes the covenant with David. It's called the Davidic covenant. It's an original title. I know I didn't come up with it. I'm just repeating it. And in there, he tells David, if you walk blameless before me, if your son, if you provide me with an obedient son, if he walks blameless before me through him, we're going to bless the nations. Through your obedient son, the whole world will know the Lord. The whole world will be full of worship. The whole world will know what it is to be loved by God. The Lord says to David, if your son is obedient, I will be a father to him. I will guide him. I will teach him. I will lead him everywhere he needs to go. Now, if you know the story of David's son, Solomon, it's very similar It starts out well. Solomon builds the house of the Lord. And then it gets worse and worse and worse. And Solomon has a whole bunch of marriages and takes on a whole bunch of people's gods. And he forgets the God of David completely. David was to provide the Lord with the obedient son that through him the world might know the Lord. David couldn't do it. This was, by the way, you remember the promise in Genesis chapter 3 when God says to Adam, through your offspring, one will come that will crush the serpent's head. As people saw David, they're asking themselves, this is the one. This is the one who will crush the head of the serpent. This is the one who will reverse the curse. And then David's downfall happens and people realize this isn't the one. But then they look at David's son who builds the temple, the one who the Lord says, I will be his father. I will lead him. I will guide him. And then look to Solomon and they said, maybe this is the one. This is the obedient son who will reverse the curse. But Solomon couldn't do it either. The Lord had to provide the obedient son. God the father had to provide the obedient son, the one who would reverse the curse, the one who would take the serpent, strike in his foot, and in so doing, crush the head of that old serpent, the devil. God the Father provided the obedient son in the person of Jesus. And this is what it says about Jesus. I read this earlier. But in Philippians 2, it says that Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus is the obedient son, the one who will reverse the curse. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The worldwide blessing that God desires happens through Jesus. Jesus is the answer to the curse that we experience today. And while Jesus walked this earth, look at what he says. He says, you know, he's talking to his disciples, he's talking to his followers, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their officials exercise authority over them. You know the rulers trust in their own strength, and they use their strength to bully people who have less strength than they do. Your rulers, they live by might makes right. They're looking for the tall ones who are going to enforce everything and control the lives of the short ones. Verse 26, not so with you. My kingdom is an upside-down kingdom. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, he embodies the prayer that Hannah gave so many years before. When Hannah prayed, the Lord brings down the powerful but raises up the weak. When the Lord spoke through Hannah, don't talk about tall anymore. Don't talk about this strength. Don't talk about putting strength in yourself. 
because it's not by strength that one prevails. Jesus prevailed, and how did he do so? Through his death. When the world looked at Jesus on the cross, they saw a weak man who had been conquered by the Romans, by the Jews, who had been conquered by the people around him. Because they still live by, it is in strength that one prevails. But in God's kingdom, as we know, that's not by strength that one prevails. We see Jesus on the cross, not as a picture of weakness, but as a picture of victory. As a picture of the one that through his death, he takes that curse and he reverses the curse. He kills the curse and he says that curse is no more. Because of Jesus on the cross, we can know the blessing. We can know the life that God has for us. And so my question to you today, do you know the life? Does your heart know the life of Jesus? Do you see the life of Jesus in your own heart, in your own actions? Do you see the life of Jesus in your days as you live them? Or do you look at yourself and say, I'm trying to live by my own strength. I'm trying to be strong enough and smart enough and fast enough and rich enough and pretty enough and whatever it is that I need to be. Because it's through my strength that I will prevail. Or have you heard the call of Christ that says, you don't need to be the strongest. By the way, preachers love it when people cry. <laughs> If you've ever talked to a preacher, you know it, true. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> now, where was I? Oh, Jesus, that's right. Uh, do you find yourself trying to live out of your own strength? Do you find yourself saying, if I work hard enough, things will be fine. If I can be there enough, if I can be strong enough, if I can endure, things will be fine. Or have you come to the point where you've realized, it's not by my strength, it's not by my might, it's not by my power, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord. It's not by strength that one prevails. The call of Christ. When Jesus says, come unto me and lay down your burden at my feet and I will give you rest, he's saying, lay down this burden of thinking it's all on you, that you have to be big enough and tall enough and strong enough and rich enough and whatever it is. That's a burden because we never can be. Those who live by their own strength will always find someone stronger. Those who live by their own wealth will always find someone richer. Those who live by their intelligence will always find someone smarter. It's not by that that we prevail. Jesus says, take that burden. Take that despair that comes from it and lay it down. And I will give you rest. We can't rest, church when our souls are working 24 hours a day. We can't rest, O oh church, when our hearts are full of despair, wondering if we've made it. Have I done enough good things for God to love me? We can't have rest. Rest only comes when we know intimately and deeply that Jesus, He has done it for me. It's through his strength that we can prevail. It's through His strength that we have peace. It's through His strength that we have hope. If you're here today and if you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, surrendered your strength to Jesus, what's keeping you? Come today. Come to the Father today. And you'll hear Him say, Welcome my son. Welcome, my daughter. 
welcome to my family. Let's pray. Are you praying wrap, wrap it up preacher music or you got a song? I got a song. Oh, okay. We're going to pray, then we got a song. Oh, Lord. Oh, how we need you. Because worthy is the name of Jesus. Jesus, you can do all the things that we could never do. Though we try our hardest, though we say, I'm strong enough, I'm big enough, if I only look to myself, I'll make it. Jesus, when you hear us say that, you smile. And I believe you smile and I believe you say, okay, go and try. And then inevitably, Lord, when that doesn't work, you give us the call. Come to me. Lay that burden down. Take my rest upon you. Come and experience in life and experience it to the full. God, I pray for us as we're gathered here that anyone here who is experiencing that burden, who tells himself it's all on me and I hope I can measure up, Lord, would you take that burden away that they might know you. That they might know the one who said, of whom it is said, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not put out. That they might know the mighty Jesus, the one who is mighty to save, the one who is willing to go to war to save his people, the one who is willing to go into war against the gods of Egypt, against our gods today in order to secure freedom for your people, that your people might know you, this mighty, this dangerous Jesus, this one who is not safe, but he is good, and we can trust in him. Come, Lord Jesus.